today, for the Experts in Emotion interview, we'll be speaking with Dr. Naomi Eisenberger um, on the nature of social pain. So Dr. Eisenberger received her PhD from UCLA and is currently an Associate Professor of Psychology, still at UCLA, and the co-director of the Social Cognitive Neuroscience Laboratory. Her work focuses on understanding social pain as well as social pleasure. This includes the neural basis of social rejection, social connection, as well as social support and health. She's published widely in top-tier journals, including Science, Social Cognitive Affective Neuroscience, and the Proceedings for the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Eisenberger's work has been recognized by numerous awards, including a NARSAT Award, Janet Taylor Spence Award from the Association for Psychological Science, the Sage Young Scholars Award, and the Herbert Weiner Early Career Award from the American Psychosomatic Society. So I now turn with great pleasure to our Experts in Emotion interview, together with Dr. Naomi Eisenberger. So welcome, Naomi. Thanks for speaking today. Thank you for having me. What I wanted to start out with is just asking you a little bit about what first got you interested in emotion. Um, I don't know that there was any one incident. I think I've always been really interested in psychological experience and very sort of attuned to what's going on in my mind and what's going on in my body. And emotion is one of those things that sort of captures your attention mm -hmm. um, in ways that other experiences don't necessarily um, capture it. So, you know, you notice that all of a sudden your body feels different and your motivations are different and what you're thinking about is different. Um, and I think that's just sort of what, what got me interested in emotion. Excellent. Well, I wanted to then ask you about some of your work in this field because you've really, you know, pioneered, you know, work on the neural basis of things really relevant to emotion like social rejection, showing that social pain can actually hurt. And so I wondered if you could say a little bit about your work here, talking about how social pain may actually share similar brain mechanisms to physical pain. Yeah, so I've been interested in rejection for a while just because rejection is one of those kinds of experiences that can, you know, change your emotions in major ways. You know, people all of a sudden when they're giving a speech and they know that they could be evaluated, that they could be rejected, and all of a sudden you have your heart racing and your mouth gets dry. Um, people go to great lengths to avoid getting rejected. Um, so we do all these things to try to prevent uh, rejection in our own lives. And I was just sort of curious, how does the brain process rejection? Um, and so we brought people into the fMRI scanner and we set up this game um, that Kip Williams has used before called Cyberball. And essentially what happens here is people play this online virtual ball tossing game uh, with what they think are two other individuals. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they're playing the ball together and that at a certain point in time, um, the two players who are actually controlled by a computer stop throwing the ball to the subject. The subject essentially is socially excluded. Um, and so here we could look at what's going on in the brain during that moment when individuals are feeling socially excluded, when they're experiencing social exclusion. Um, and when we were running this study, mm -hmm. we got back the data and I was actually analyzing it I was sitting next to um, a fellow graduate student who was analyzing a study on physical pain. Mm. And this was a study like in irritable bowel syndrome patients. So these were serious chronic pain patients. Mm -hmm. We were sitting next to each other. We each had our data up on our computer mm. screens. And at some point we noticed just how similar our data looked. I was looking at a study on social rejection. She was looking at a study on you know, chronic pain, manipulated pain experience. And at some point you sort of, it got hard to tell which study you were looking at. Wow. And so based off that, we thought, you know, it, it sort of looks like social rejection is activating some of these same neural regions that are implicated in physical pain processing. Um, and in some ways it makes sense when you think about this from an evolutionary perspective, um, given how important social connection is for human survival and for more broadly speaking mammalian survival, um, it's possible that the system that makes sure that we stay socially connected may have actually piggybacked right on top of the physical pain system. So kind of borrowing that pain signal not only to alert us when our bodies are in danger of being harmed, but when our social relationships are in danger of being harmed as well. Such fascinating work. And it makes me wonder, I know you've done some work here, you know, to what extent, you know, can we think about using interventions then that are focused on alleviating physical pain to remedy sort of everyday social pain? 
Um, so we've looked at that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So based on this physical social, so social pain overlap, we've been very interested in whether altering one kind of experience mm -hmm. can alter the other in a similar way. Um, and we've been able to show that, you know, maybe some surprising things that things like mm -hmm. a regular over-the-counter painkiller, something like Tylenol, not only can reduce physical pain, but it seems to be capable of reducing social pain as well. Now, I'm not suggesting people go out and take a bunch of Tylenol. Uh, there are other ways. Um, if you think about you know, similarities between physical and social pain, there are other things that can ameliorate both. So any kind of activity that increases opioid processing. So opioids are also potent painkillers, and they're, you know, we have them within our bodies. And so any activity, like for example, exercise, which increases the release of opioids um, may have not only physical pain reducing effects, but social pain reducing effects as well. So interesting. I mean, and I'm also thinking, you know, of this domain of work that's just so fascinating, changed the way of what we think of, you know, what social pain really is. You've also been conducting work looking at, I guess, the lighter side of social connection as well by exploring social connection and social pleasure. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what we know about the neural circuitry here that may underlie these feelings of social warmth. Yeah, so yeah. we've sort of more recently tried to yeah. switch our focus a little, to focus on some of the more positive aspects of social relationships, and we've done this in a number of different ways. Um, you mentioned social warmth. So in the same way mm -hmm. that we've been looking at what are sort of the neural bases of social pain, what are the sort of more basic neural systems that may have been co-opted to support socially painful experiences. We've also been trying to do the same thing on the positive side. So what are the more basic neural systems that may have been co-opted to support those you know, feelings of social connection? Um, and so one of the experiences that we've looked at is social warmth. These are sort of the warm feelings that we have when we feel bonded and connected with others. Um, and we've been curious and interested in whether these experiences rely on temperature regulation mechanism. So a lot of times we'll say things like, um, uh, you know, I have a warm feeling towards that person or I felt warm hearted. So we use these um, temperature related words to describe mm. feelings of social closeness. Um, so in a recent study, and this isn't published yet, but in a recent mm. study, we tried to manipulate an experience of social warmth and manipulate an experience of physical warmth and look to see if we're getting overlapping neural activity in regions that typically process temperature and physical warmth. Mm -hmm. um, so in the social warmth task, essentially, we bring in subjects and ahead of time, we contact their friends and family members and we have them provide us with um, sort of loving email messages. <laughs> um, so these, these were actually very touching. They were things like, you know, I couldn't live my life without you in it. Mm -hmm. um, and these were real messages from their family. Um, so they did one task where they were viewing these messages for the first time, and then they did another task where they were just sort of holding on to a warm pack mm -hmm. um, when they were in the scanner, and this was compared to a control condition when they were holding on to a squeeze ball. Um, <clears throat> and so essentially what we found was overlapping neural activity um, in two regions, um, the mid-insula and the ventral striatum, mm -hmm. regions that in prior studies have been shown to be involved in processing physical warmth. Um, so we see that there may be some, and you know, this is a beginning study, but there yeah. may be some kind of overlap um, between the neural mechanisms that are involved in processing temperature and in processing social warmth. And some other behavioral studies have shown this as well. So if you like work by John Barge, if you hold on yeah. to a warm cup of coffee, you perceive other people as warmer. Um, and this is sort of a neural investigation of some of those overlapping mechanisms. So interesting. I mean, what do you think, you know, are going to be some of the most important advances in this field of social warmth as it moves forward? I mean, your, your findings that you're talking about that you're currently working on right now are some of them, but do you think there's other important directions that we want to move forward in to really understand what social warmth is, especially at, you know, the neural level? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know exactly where this will go. Yeah. Um, but there are so many different kinds of experiences that can make people feel socially connected. You know, we've looked at yeah. social warmth. We've also looked at experiences where people are 
feeling understood by others, which seems to tap mm -hmm. into some of these same reward related neural regions. And so I think going forward, what would be nice and what I'm ultimately looking for is some kind of larger theoretical framework for understanding all of these different types of experiences of social connection. How do we organize mm -hmm. them? Um, are they subdivided in some kind of meaningful way? So that's at this point what I want yeah. is some kind of um, larger theoretical yeah. structure for understanding all of these you know, yeah. smaller types of positive social experiences. And speaking, you know, of this domain of work, I mean, finally, you've also done some really important work looking at questions aimed at understanding the role that social support plays, you know, in our physical health. And I wonder what you think we know right now about this link between social support and health. Yeah, so this is yeah. probably actually the question that first got me interested in oh. psychology in the first place. Um, I think I was an undergrad at the time. and learned about the strong link between social support and health. And really, you know, for the past 30 or so years, this has been one of the strongest findings within the field of health psychology and social epidemiology. The people who have fewer social ties are at a greater risk for morbidity and mortality. And the risk factor is on par with things like smoking. So smoking wow. is a risk factor for health on par with not having social ties. Mm -hmm. And so I've always been curious on why, why does that relationship yeah. exist? What are the mechanisms that explain that link between social support and health? Um, and so we've been doing a little bit of work on this domain, sort of starting from the top, starting to try to understand what are the neural mechanisms that underlie experiences of social support. And we focus both on what's going on when people are receiving social support from others, as well as what's going on when people are giving social support to others. Um, and I think probably, I'm oh, sorry, I'm skipping to your next question. No, no, go ahead. What, what, what have you found? <laughs> yeah. One of the most um, yeah. interesting things, because it seems kind of counterintuitive, comes from some of the work that we've been doing on support giving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when people think about social support, they sort of assume that all the psychological benefits yeah. or all the health benefits come from all the stuff that we get from other people, all the support yeah. that they give us. Um, and we've been exploring whether some of the benefits also come from the support that we give to others. So we've looked, we've been looking neurally at what's going on when people are engaged in giving support to a significant other. So in this particular study, we bring in couples, we scan the females as they provide support to their partners. So their partners stand right outside the scanner, and on some trials, their partner gets electric shock um, mm -hmm. while the female holds his arm as he goes through, through this experience. Um, and what we find in these studies is greater activity in reward-related regions that seem to be implicated in Uh, maternal caregiving behavior in animals. Hmm. And what's interesting is there seems to be this hint that when people are engaged in support giving, not only does it activate these reward related regions, but it seems to relate to less activity in certain regions that are often associated with processing threats, so regions wow. like the amygdala. Mm -hmm. um, and so we think that, you know, one possibility is that the act of support giving is actually threat reducing in some kind of way, at least physiologically speaking. And we're currently looking at more into this or running a study where people are randomly assigned to either provide support or go through a control task uh, before they go through their own stressful experience. And in, in this particular mm -hmm. situation, people who are just engaged in support giving actually seem to be less physiologically responsive. They show less of an increase in heart rate and in blood pressure mm -hmm. in response to that later stress task. Wow. Um, so there, there may be um, sort of more benefits to support giving um, than just for the person receiving the support. So where do you see the future of this field headed in, from your perspective? Um, I, I don't know. I will be excited to find out. Mm -hmm. I guess I feel like emotion research is probably still in the early stages uh, mm -hmm. when I teach my course in emotion, which is typically taught as a graduate course. Um, I probably spend, you know, the first three classes um, either talking about just what is an emotion, just sort of going over the definition, yeah. going over people's different approaches to understanding it, 
Um, so even the fact that we don't sort of have an agreed upon definition yet to me suggests that we're in the very early stages. Um, so I don't know what the future holds, but I will be excited to see as there's more and more research coming in. And what advice do you typically give to students then who come to you asking about, should I embark in this field of emotion? You know, how should I be spending my time or what should I be doing? Uh, well, I, of course, think that emotion is one of the most interesting mm -hmm. topics in the world. So anyone who is coming to me interested, I would yeah. suggest definitely go down that line. Um, but I guess I would recommend uh, reading as much as you can, reading from lots of different perspectives, mm -hmm. um, but also sort of keeping in mind your own experience and, like, do, mm -hmm. and does your own experience jive mm -hmm. with these different theoretical perspectives. I love that. So reading widely and really connecting your own experience to the science that you're reading in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. Well, thank you so much for speaking today, Naomi. It was wonderful to hear your thoughts and have this opportunity. Sure. Thank you so much. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Naomi Eisenberger from the University of California, Los Angeles. Thank you so much.